um, prokaryotic chromosome structure. Typically, it's a closed, circular, double-stranded DNA molecule that's looped and coiled extensively. So as I mentioned previously, there's so much DNA, it can't just haphazardly be packed in like a messy suitcase. There's got to be a high level of, of folding and, and organization in order to, for the bacterium to be able to um, effectively utilize the DNA. Uh, there are definitely nucleoid proteins that probably aid in the folding, just, just like you and I have histones in our um, nuclei. But, they're nu but the bacterial nucleoid proteins differ chemically from the histones that we have. Bacteria also have plasmids, which are small, closed circular DNA molecules that can exist and replicate independently of the chromosome. Um, they usually are small, so they don't have a ton of genes on them. Um, and they're not often essential. Usually what they do is confer some kind of selective advantage to the host. So um, a microbe could have a drug-resistant plasmid, for example, and the microbe may not need the drug-resistant plasmid under most circumstances, but if it suddenly infects an individual and then that individual is treated with those drugs, the plasmid could be beneficial. As for the bacterial cell wall, the, oh, so just let me show you real quick. So imagine, they don't show it here, but imagine a plasmid then might be a little circle of DNA off in the cytoplasm, separate from the nucleus. But the rigid cell wall um, that bacteria rely on to maintain their shape um, isn't pictured here either, but I'll show you a cartoon of it eventually. But it lies just outside the plasma membrane. The functions are, as I've talked about, maintaining shape and protection from osmotic lysis. Sometimes it even contributes to pathogenicity. So microbes can actually slough off pieces of their cell wall to cause toxic effects to the host. But there are some prokaryotes that lack cell walls, and some of them are pathogenic. So <clears throat> the um, walls of bacteria can be divided into two groups based on the gram stain procedure, which you'll um, learn a little bit about in the lab section of the class. So gram-positive bacteria stain purple and gram-negative bacteria stain pink using the gram stain technique. And again, I'll show you a video of it. But the staining reactions due to the wall structure, and, I'll, and this picture sort of illustrates that point. On the left here is a gram-positive arrangement. On the right is the gram-negative arrangement. So there's a cartoon of it and then an actual micrograph of it. And so here's the ground positive. The peptidoglycan that you see here is the actual cell wall, this thick orange layer, <laughs> or as it's colored here. And then the plasma membrane is here, this red layer. And then there's a tiny little space in between called the periplasm. So in this micrograph, here's our cell wall. And then this little thin red layer, red line here is the plasma membrane. You don't really see the space here, because it, but it's really, it's there, but it's really small. Now in the gram negative, you see uh, an outer membrane. This thin little line in the middle here is the um, peptidoglycan, and then the plasma membrane. So right off the bat, you can see that there are some functional differences between gram negative and gram positives. The gram negatives have an outer membrane, and they have a very thin um, peptidoglycan or cell wall layer, as opposed to this very thick peptidoglycan or cell wall layer. And so again, you can see that in the electron micrograph. But looking more closely at the chemistry of the peptidoglycan layer, it's, it's very similar between gram negatives and gram positives. So the peptidoglycan consists essentially of a lattice work of N-acetylglucosamine and, and N-acetylmuramic acid monomers that are rot alternating. These little strings in the middle are glycosidic linkages. So here's a side chain of amino acids coming off the N-acetylmuramic acid. And these side chains of amino acids have cross-links that, that link them to the adjacent strand of alternating NAM and NAG. And so this little cross-linkages keeps the, this, this, the cell wall tight and rigid and intact. If we look more closely at the chemistry of, of one of these monomers, so a monomer would be um, a NAG, a NAM, and a side chain. That's what's pictured here. So here's our NAM, our NAG, and our side chain. And it's cross-linked to an adjacent NAM, NAG, side chain. So this here would be a gram-negative arrangement. And this here would be a gram-positive arrangement. So you can get a, a 
sense of the difference in the chemistry, not just the physical size and that kind of thing, but the chemistry is a little different between the gram negative and gram positive as well. So the um, side chain consists of alanine, glutamic acid, this unusual thing called DAP, <laughs> amino acid called DAP, and then a terminal alanine. Whereas in the gram positives, we've got um, alanine, glut glutamate, I'm sorry, alanine, glutamine, um, lysine, alanine. And so again, we've got the uh, <clears throat> um, um, glutamate here and glutamine here. And so the, the cross bridge is different as well. This is a direct linkage between this alanine and this diaminopamelic acid or DAP. These physically contact each other and make a bond, whereas this alanine and this lysine are, are, are bound by a bridge of glycine amino acids, a so-called peptide interbridge. So there's a couple amino acids that are different in gram positives, and there's a bridge that's different between gram positive and gram negative. Um, the gram positive cell wall is mostly peptidoglycan, as you saw from that particular cartoon that I showed you before. It's very thick peptidoglycan, but it also contains binding things like tachoic acids that I'll show you. And so <clears throat> it looks like this then. Here's that. Here's a cartoon showing the big thick peptidoglycan layer. You can get a sense for, you know, here's the N-acetylglucosamine and here's the N-acetylmuramic acid. And then here's the little amino acid side chains. But these are the tachoic acids. And here's lipotachoic acid. So these things are used by the microbes to stick to tissue or whatever. Here's the plasma membrane with some transmembrane proteins. And so these transmembrane proteins could be sensor proteins. So imagine this is like a sugar molecule that comes percolating through. This thing can bind the sugar and take it in, for example. But they can have many functions, not just transporting sugar. <laughs> As far as the gram negatives, it's clearly more complex. There's an extra, there's an extra layer, and there's just you know a few extra things that are happening. Yeah, there's an outer membrane, particularly that's composed of lipids, lipoproteins, and lipopolysaccharide. But there's no tachoic acids. Peptidoglycan is only a small part of the wall weight, whereas in gram positives, it's a huge part of the wall weight. Um, periplasmic space differs that, from that in gram positive cells. And so again, you can kind of see from this cartoon the differences. Now this little layer here is the, is the peptidoglycan layer in contrast to this peptidoglycan layer in the gram positive. So there's an outer membrane that we see here in gram negatives. And then in the outer membrane are a whole unique series of proteins, like these porins, for example, they're, as the name suggests. So little amino acids can go through these little barrels and go into the, into the cell. For example, not just amino acids, but other things. So the, um, excuse me, the, the um, lipopolysaccharide, the outer part of the lipopolysaccharide, um, outer membrane is called LPS. And so these little red spheres and the little side chains here with the sugars coming off of them are, are called LPS or lipopolysaccharide. And then the inner leaflet of the outer membrane looks like a normal phospholipid, as you can see here. And so these phospholipids are the same as this. So the, the Inner, inner leaflet of the outer membrane <laughs> is the same as both leaflets of the plasma membrane. Here's our little peptidoglycan layer again, and then again, here's our outer membrane with associated embedded proteins in the gram negative. The lipopolysaccharide, that outer part, consists of three parts, lipid A, core polysaccharide, and the O side chain, or O antigen as we call it. And so we can look at that a little more closely. Here's the our chemical structure. So this would be the red little pill in that other picture. Here's a little fatty acid side chain. Imagine the other um, half of the phospholipid over um, down here. Here's a bunch of sugars that stick out into the world. So the main components are lipid A, core polysaccharide, and O side chain. And so um, these this this entire molecule is, is, uh, is, you know, obviously gives the microbe structure, but it also has different functions. And so I can show you that here. The importance is that it protects the cell from host defenses. So one of the things that the microbe can do is modify the sugars. So if the microbe infects an individual, it can modify the 
those sugars and its O-antigen and confuse the host immune response. Another thing is it contributes negative charge to the cell surface. And so things that are positively charged um, can, be, uh, can be repelled. And so, I'm sorry, not repelled. I'm sorry, things that are negatively charged can be repelled by the negative charge on the surface. And obviously it helps stabilize the outer membrane because it's a physical part. But the other thing that it can do is act as a toxin. So microbes can actually slough this little component, this piece off of their cell, and cause toxic effects. Just like I mentioned previously, where the uh, pieces of the cell wall can slough off and cause to um, toxic reactions in hosts. So again, um, and, and this LAL testing, I would encourage you to just do a Google search of LAL testing. It's, a, it's commonly done in, in a lot of research labs, so it's a good thing to kind of know about. I've had a few students go work in industry, and, and they were asked questions about LAL testing because it might be part of their job, and they were, um, the, the employers were surprised to know that, that they had learned about this. So, but basically, it's a, it's a way to detect these LPS toxins. It's not enough if you're working in um, pharmaceuticals, to, for example, to just say, oh, we've tested for bacteria and viruses and molds, and our pharmaceutical product is free of bacteria, viruses, and molds, and therefore it's safe. You also have to consider whether or not lipid A or endotox uh, endotoxin is present. And so, again, we call this structure endotoxin because it's part of the physical um, cell envelope. But, um, but it can act as an exotoxin, <laughs> meaning that the microbe can slough that endotoxin out into the world. And in that particular case, it acts like a normal toxin. Anyway, so this LAL testing is used to detect trace amounts of this pretty deadly stuff in the host animal. And so it's a, it uses a, the blood of a horseshoe crab, <laughs> which is really weird. But it uses the blood of a horseshoe crab, which is extremely sensitive to um, lipid A or LPS and, um, and a, a particular reaction that happens with the blood lets you know that you have trace amounts of, of the toxin in your sample.